Okay, recording in progress. There we go. Um, and so first on the panel, we have Jen L. Sesser and Ted Bridge Konigsberg from Sebago Elementary School. Um, did you guys want me to share your presentation and then you talk through it? Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me bring that up. Oh, and I will say, Following this, um, everyone is going to get resources and things sent to you, just so you all know. Uh, okay. Sorry. Sure. Okay. See my screen? Yep. Okay, go for it. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I'm Ted Bridge Konigsberg and Jen L. Sesser is on this call as well. I teach fourth grade and she teaches kindergarten at Sebago Elementary School. It's a small school, about 115, 120 kids, um, pre-K through five, one grade um, per grade, one class per grade level. We've had a school garden probably almost, well, not 20 years yet, but certainly 15 years. Um, and what we're going to focus today on is a very specific garden crop and what happened this year and some activities we've done with it. And Jen, thankfully, has pulled together some phenomenal, the, the slides are, 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 I give her all the credit. My children took some of the pictures, but in reality, Jen pulled it all together. Um, so we, we grew tomatoes this year. We Some years are more successful with tomatoes than others. Um, this year, we were planted 25 tomato plants, anticipating that they would, the fruit would be used in our school cafeteria um, salad bar. And they, tomatoes grew well. We had no problems with tomato hornworms <laughs> per se. Um, our gardens are oftentimes, it was, they struggle because of watering. And even with a watering system, we still struggle. But this year we had lots of tomatoes boatloads of tomatoes, beyond boatloads of tomatoes. And, um, but I've learned something and that doesn't mean it's in every community, but not, children generally are not as excited about raw tomatoes as I used to think, um, which, which has meant that we just had so many tomatoes. Um, and Jen and I talked about what could we do with all these tomatoes. And she'd had some experience making salsa and, and with, with her kindergarten kids that are in another school. And she said, I'll gladly make salsa. And that's actually the second slide, Kelsey, if you can flip over to that one. That's, there you go. And, and, and yeah, so you can see there are pictures of Jen's class making salsa. Um, she's got this incredible book, which I think Kelsey, you talked about possibly being one of the options for the March um, May Nag in the Classroom Read aloud, right? It's, it's kind of, it's my vote. Uh, you and I are voting for it. Yes, I think. <laughs> um, so, and, and her kids read that one. Um, she also has other books on the side. Um, tremendous, tremendous resources. And the kids, my kids got to go and sample the salsa and it really was indeed delicious. Um, and the kids had a blast. It was a great experience and it used up lots of tomatoes. So if you go back to my slide for a second, Kelsey, um, we were given, the PTC purchased a juicer for us, mostly because of the grapes we grow. But I said to the kids, as we started dealing with all these tomatoes, what are we gonna do? And they said, well, we could make tomato sauce or we could make ketchup. And I said, what about tomato juice? And they said, okay. So I got the juicer out and we started making tomato juice. And those two, there's some pictures of children picking tomatoes up at the top. There's a picture on the left with um, one of the trays from the cafeteria, just showing lots and lots of cherry tomatoes. And then the other two pictures to me are really important because that's the juicer in action. And the picture on the right is particularly important from the old science teacher perspective because their children can see the relationship between solids, liquids, and gases right in front of them. It's not, it is classic. And the amazing thing is the kids drank it, not all of them, but enough of them drank it so that I can say we can use up surplus excess extra tomatoes making juice. So, and that's, and I, we chose the book, I Will Never Eat a Tomato, which is absolutely delightful. 
Um, and I'd recommend both of those. So that's that's it for us at Tomatoes. We, I think we called it Tomatoes of Plenty at Sebago Elementary School. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. And there are links in this. Um, oh, yes, Kelsey. Those, Jen was able to get those books as read alouds. Yeah, I saw that. So she's pretty amazing. I mean, not pretty. She's amazing, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, um, just to add a little more engagement into the Kindergarten Students Day, if you go to our second slide, Kelsey, we also um, learned how to dance the salsa. And these are all safe tube links, so they don't have any ads in them. So this is a link on how a kid-friendly version of teaching students how to salsa. Um, we also have links for two salsa recipes. Um, and we did the mild without jalapenos this year. But in the past, I have had classes where over 60% of the students like the salsa with the jalapenos. So I definitely would advise teachers if they'd like to try making salsa with their students to try both a mild and a medium version. Um, if you go to the third slide, there's just some TPT, Teachers Pay Teachers, some resources um, for teachers if they'd like to use them, and just some additional tomato math activities and reading activities from kindergarten for kindergarten. When Willie was the national president for um, agriculture in the classroom, she put on a wonderful, wonderful conference in Portland. And there was one session I went to in particular where they immerse students with just the seeds from vegetables. They made art with vegetables by using tomato seeds and wrote about it. They made numbers with tomato and bean and zucchini and plant seeds. So these are just a couple activities um, that you can use with your kindergartners and higher. I believe the first Google Slides um, is an activity that goes up to sixth grade, which is nice. And then the very last slide is just a reminder about Donors Choose. This is one grant I had funded on Donors Choose, taking science to new heights with a few new grow lights. Um, and this was flash funded by, <clears throat> on a day where every single grant on Donors Choose was funded. And this was an example of some items that were able to be purchased for our classroom and school garden. Nice. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else either of you want to add? Kelsey, I, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed I can't relocate it, but I know I was using the, um, it's, I think it's a virtual, virtual farm tour from the National Ag Matrix, and there's one on growing tomato, on tomato farming, but I'm, I'm not, I know, I don't have a link, and but but there was something more on a a, a large production scale out in California, I think. But I, I, as hey. I say, I don't. It, someone much wiser and more proficient will be able to find it than me. I can try and look for that. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much to both of you for that and learning about um, tomatoes. So next we are um, going to hear from Lynn Snow at Thomas, who's at Thomaston Grammar School. Thanks, Kelsey. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Lynn Snow. I teach at Thomaston Grammar School. I teach fourth and fifth grade now, uh, all their science, social studies and health. I was their um, social studies and ELA teacher for a long time in fifth grade. And I had um, ELA in science, and this year I have the cream of the crop of the schedules, teaching three really fun subjects and the ability to integrate them um, together and not the pressure of teaching literacy, <laughs> although I am starting to miss it a little bit. So I'm excited this conference is based on literacy and how to bring some 
great pieces of literature into the garden. Uh, the book I'm gonna talk about today is this one. It's called Seed Folks. It's probably backwards on your screen. My slideshow won't be back. It isn't, okay. Um, Seed Folks is a, I've been teaching this book ever since we started our school garden in 2009. It's a book that has 13 characters and all the characters tell their piece of how they bring together a community garden in Cleveland, Ohio. It's a fictional story, uh, but it incorporates so much um, cultures and social emotional learning and history. Um, it, if you haven't read this book, I suggest you at least read it. It's a quick read and consider teaching it for kids probably anywhere from third to eighth grade um, could do this book. It's a, a wide range. Okay, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and I'm going to run my own slideshow and if I can't Kelsey has it so let's see if we can do this. Okay, hold on. Okay, maybe I can I got to get my Google up here things are in the way so bear with me for a minute as I move them and get this running. All right. Gonna move you guys out of the way too. Okay, are we good? Yes. All right. Okay. All right, Seed Folks by uh, Paul Fleischman. And I can't seem to turn my page, Kelsey. Click on, <laughs> click on the, like click right there and then just now try. Nope, I can't turn my page, I don't know why. Okay. Try the bottom left. Okay, I found it. Thank you. All right. So here's my learning targets. I'm not going to read them to you all, but it uh, just shows that you can do a lot with this book more than just teaching about gardening. Um, the first learning target is said I can be an active listener. So how I run this book is I do a read aloud or I may do a shared reading if I have... Um, decent readers in my classroom, and we all know what that means as a teacher. Um, and then I use the audio files. So with on the, in this page, I've actually incorporated, I've linked to some of the audio files. I won't bother to play those now, but you will have them. Uh, they're all available on YouTube, or you can purchase them through some audio link. Um, and the characters tell their own story. And they've done this so well because Kim is a nine-year-old Vietnamese girl and they have found a girl that would probably sound like this to read the story themselves. So the kids enjoy first having an opportunity to hear it with me or share it with them and then hearing it again through the audio files of a voice that may actually be this character. They develop um, character pages. This is the one of the way I, ways I teach the book. Um, and they come together. Can you guys see me as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So here's your, here's a, one of my character books. I've done these for years and each page has one of the characters and they have to do three things on the page. They have to do an illustration. So they have to be able to visualize what this character might look like. They do a character chart trying to determine internal and external characteristics. And then they answer three questions on each character. What's their closest connection to farming? Um, what do they learn about the community inferencing skills or the garden through the character? And they learn about predicting because they have to make a prediction for each of the characters. This is what some of the pages look like, students have in the past. On the back of the character page, I've done something for um, each individual character. I'm happy to, sh I happen to show here Se Young, who's um, a Korean woman who has uh, experienced some abuse in, in her store in the United States and what the garden does for her. And they, they bring a book to self-connection there and talk about what some of their groups are um, able to uh, do for them. And then these all get assembled, of course, into the book. I've done this several times, um, except for the last time I taught the book, I did something a little bit different. So I just wanted to see those pages. I have a lot of projects I do with this book. So on this one, and I always have a map out, a map of the United States and a map of the world, 
because within the book, there's characters coming from uh, India and Russia um, and Vietnam and Korea and England. And then there's also some characters right within the United States. Kendall from Kentucky uh, is one of the characters in the book. So I like to I like to incorporate geography and some history and some cultural lessons and how these characters come together from all these different places because they all happen to live in Cleveland, Ohio uh, to build this community garden, so one of the projects. I've had kids build models of the garden, just bringing in a lot of stuff and working together and trying to um, create what they might think the garden looks like. They might do this out of a cardboard box. I've seen it done out of Legos. Um, clay, all kinds of options. This girl on the right here developed a game one year, uh, the Seed Folk game that kids could play. Uh, here's a, another model of the garden. On the right is Morgan, who is very artistic and was struggling with this, but she was able to do this piece of artwork that showed the, the characters within the circle and then um, on the outside of the circle and then what they grow in the middle. That was really a something that took her a long time to do and she was very proud of, as you can tell by that picture. Mm. Yeah, and here's um, a trifold. Now this girl um, <laughs> wasn't the best drawer, but she took a seed catalog and was able to use that to develop a project that was um, came out really nicely and presented to her classmates. Um, one year, and I've only done this once, but I will do this again. I had kids do a trifold board, a science board, Whenever I have that done with fifth graders or now fourth graders, so I always cut those boards in half because they're so huge. Um, so they're not so um, cumbersome to work with. And on this one, they had to have three parts. So on the left-hand side, they had to make the character's connection to um, the place they were from. And there are standards there. And then in the middle is the character themselves, the person, um, uh, hand-drawn image, and they also had to write a second chapter for this character because the characters never get repeated within the book. You hear about them once and then you hear a new character's perspective on the garden. There, there may be some references to the characters, but you, they don't get a second chapter. So um, kids had to write a new chapter for that character. Like what happened now with Curtis? Did he marry Letitia? And did they have a garden wedding? There's some great ideas. <laughs> <laughs> if you've read the book, you know those characters. And then finally, um, the science and health connection to whatever it was that they were growing within the garden. And by the way, the, um, the second chapters, I actually sent those to Paul Fleischman and he responded back um, to us about those. So that was, that was a pretty neat thing. Um, and here's some of these. So this is Amir, a character from India and what the student did with, with the information on him. And of course they were all done. Um, kids worked with a partner to do these, so we had them on display at our end of the year assembly. Um, now, last year I said I didn't do the books, I did something different. I'm going to hopefully this is going to work. I'm going to click on this link, and yep, it's not going to work, so I'm not going to bother with it. <laughs> See if I can go back there um, because of access, I guess. But I had them do slideshows, so each of the students had a slideshow they created for the character and so it had to be at least 13 slides actually 15 they had to have a, a opening slide and a closing slide but each character had a slide and they wrote a short summary about the character chose some photos to use had to give credit to photos that they used on their slideshow and those that wanted to go above and beyond had a second slide after the character that talked about um, maybe where the character was from or what they planted these were some impressive, I'm sorry that doesn't work, that link. There were some impressive slideshows from these kids. It took them a while to do it, but technology is their world and, and they enjoyed that. There's a lot of writing you can do within this book. Uh, this is a quote from Nora, a nurse from England who brings uh, Mr. Miles, who's in a wheelchair to the garden, who's had a stroke and, and, um, and he is able to find some joy and um, able to plant some flowers in the garden. And this is something she says within her chapter. So students took this, everybody took the same quote and made their own connection. So it's a book to self connection. Um, and this young man, this is what he said about the book and how he's connected like the seeds. We like the seeds are now planted in the garden, how they become planted in their own school garden. 
Um, and I, and finally, um, a last literacy connection is what I termed the seed synopsis, a spinoff of a synopsis. So the back of the book, I never show it to them, what's on the back, the actual back of the book, but they have to write their own um, for the back of their books of how they would um, sum up the book and get other people to read it. And there's a couple of examples of what kids did at the end of the book to write their seed synopsis. And I think that's about it. And um, Kelsey, you're welcome to share this slideshow because it does have some links in it. And hopefully I can make those links to the, the um, kids slideshows live so people can see those. Perfect. That's it. Will, thank you, Lynn. I will add that to um, the resources that everyone gets sent. All right. Next, we will be moving to Abby Plummer from Edna Drinkwater School. Hi there. I am going to attempt to share my slideshow as well. So I'm just gonna get that popped up and press play. Is that working, Kelsey? Yes, looks good. Woo. Okay, excellent. <laughs> My name is Abby Plummer and I teach fifth and sixth grade math and science at the Edna Drinkwater School in Northport. This is my first year in this position and prior to that I was a self-contained fifth grade classroom teacher so I taught all of the subjects. Uh, I also run our after school garden program and our summer garden and student run farm stand program as well. And throughout my five years as a self-contained classroom teacher, I was constantly seeking ways to integrate our garden and greenhouse into my curriculum. One way that I've done that is by setting up stations while doing work in the garden or the greenhouse. And so I would have a main science activity, which might be led by the teacher, uh, where kids are planting or setting up an experiment or something. Um, but I also have various independent stations that connect to math and literacy. So these are just some of the ways that you can be working in the garden and greenhouse while also doing some other things tied in with literacy and math. Um, there's countless ways, I believe, that literacy just naturally connects to school gardens, which I'm sure you all agree, um, from advertising school garden taste tests to voting on crops they've grown in the garden to reading instructions for taking care of the garden or on seed packets, um, doing a lot of mapping and literacy connections, like writing thank you cards to people who helped out with food preservation projects or other volunteer efforts, um, to then reading recipes and writing their own recipes or diagramming and all of those types of connections as well. Um, I've also incorporated specific genre studies, such as nature journaling, poetry, and graphic novels. Um, what I'd really like to highlight today is some integrated reading and writing units that I've implemented in my classroom, which incorporate farm-based education. So my first year, I had a group of kids that really wanted to expand our school garden. We only had five raised beds at the time. And so for this project, I tied it in with an argument reading and writing unit. And first the students researched all of the pros and cons of school gardens. And we simultaneously learned about point of view and comparing and contrasting point of view. And then after that, students wrote argument essays to our principal to try to convince him to let us uh, have a really big garden with a 25 by 30 foot in ground bed, um, which was a big success, yay. <laughs> so I was just wanted to read one of the student introductions uh, to exemplify how the kids got into the project. Dear Mr. Martin, my whole class thinks and agrees that our garden is too small and needs to be expanded. Some people disagree. 
saying that having a larger garden or even a garden is too much money or takes up more time in school. But I argue that going into the garden teaches us about science, food, and gardening. The impact of having a bigger garden is the kids in drink water will learn a lot more about fruits and vegetables. Another reason why we should have a bigger garden is the physical activity in it. Another benefit of having a bigger garden is health and how it will change what kids decided to eat at home instead of junk food. Finally, having a larger garden will save our school money. I don't know about you, Mr. Martin, but I think this argument is very important because I know how you love the environment and gardening has very many environmental benefits. Um, so that's one example. Um, another, this was last year actually, uh, my kids made reusable beeswax wraps, which they sold at our summer farm stand, which was a student driven project that resulted from a clam investigation and wanting to reduce plastic waste in our school. Um, so this I tied in with an information writing unit and students impacted the impacts of plastic pollution, as well as how to make and use beeswax wraps. Um, they created this whole information card, this logo of the Bobcat bees wraps, because we're Bobcats at Drinkwater, um, and wrote how to take care of your beeswax wrap and how not to take care of your beeswax wrap. <laughs> um, and they created this poster, which we had up at the farm stand this summer that explains everything about their project and what led them to want to make beeswax wraps. And they're actually this year going to be making one beeswax wrap for every student in our school to give out as a gift. So we'll be doing that this year. Um, another year I was, teaching about information, reading and writing. And we took a field trip to the Common Ground Fair and students were tasked with interviewing farmers and producers at the fair to learn about the products that they'd made or services that they provide. And this tied in with the science and social studies standards. So after that, they wrote a page of a book teaching people how to create the product that they had researched at the fair. And they had to answer questions about the product or service, um, like such as the natural resources used in the product and the human and physical capital it takes. Um, I'm gonna show you a picture of the cover of the book that we ended up making, Common Ground Fair, Goods and Services. And their introduction of the book was, just to give you a, a sense of how they felt about the project, our fifth grade class here at Edna Drinkwater School took a trip to the Common Ground Fair. We went early in the morning on a September day and took the bus to Unity. We'd like to share a great experience with you through this book. In the book, you'll learn organic recipes and about some very cool products. Some products include goat milk soap, pickles, and so many more fun to make products. We will also include natural resources, which are the natural ingredients in a product, human capital, which is the work you have to do and skills you have to have in order to make a product, and lastly, physical capital, which are the man-made products used to make a product. It was so exciting to write, so enjoy. Um, and then here's just a couple of their pages. This was a relax and restore product. Um, and then a goat milk soap product. Then we had somebody who did a wheat grinder, somebody who did apple cider and just tons of other great products and services along the way, blacksmithing, everything. Um, so then the year after that, I did a twist on this project and decided instead to try it out with my narrative unit instead. Um, and so we conducted interviews again, but then students imagined themselves as the actual farmers and producers at the fair, and they wrote narratives from the point of view of that particular person. So they had those same questions to answer about natural resources and human and physical capital. Um, but this time they had to think about telling it from their point of view and to tell it as a story. So I tied it in with the reading standards and they had to think about and plan out all their own story elements for this project to really bring it alive and to jump into this character's shoes and their life. Um, I gave them a story arc so they had to plan everything out ahead of time and what was the problem that this character was going to be facing what was a challenge or obstacle about their particular um, position whether it's a service and what pro what 
um, problem they might run into while offering a service or cre creating the product. Um, and I just wanted to read one example of an introduction that a student wrote who'd interviewed um, somebody who is a sheep shearer. And this really happened at the farm. So then she sort of, I mean, at the Common Ground Fair. So then she wrote about this. Um, it felt like a waterfall was sweating from my hands. Oh, wait, sorry. I love sheep shearing, but doing it in front of people is not my strong suit. As I pulled the microphone, I felt a sensation of worry cloud over me. I breathed into the microphone, microphone and heard a loud screech sound. It echoed throughout the common ground fair. What do I say? I thought to myself. I couldn't decide to say, is everyone okay? Or I'm sorry. Just as I, that thought was being processed, I panicked and said, is everyone sorry? <laughs> So it was just really fun to see the way they jumped into these characters and imagine what it must be like to be a farmer or producer. producer. Um, so now this year I am teaching math and science and like Lynn was saying, I definitely do miss teaching literacy a lot. I love teaching literacy, but I really love math and science too. And so in some ways it has been a bit freeing to not have to focus on those literacy standards, but to also be able to still naturally integrate it. So this year, what I just did is my current sixth graders who I had in fifth grade and who planted garlic last year, I tasked them with teaching the new fifth grade class about how to plant garlic. So they, they all had to write a script, they had to research the garden, they had to read about it, read about garlic in, um, specifically, and write a whole script about how you would go about teaching someone how to plant from all the steps. So this group had the steps of how to teach about what plants need and what the garlic would need specifically. And I tied that in with the science standards on nutrient cycling and photosynthesis. Um, and so it was just another way, like I don't even teach literacy, but they had to do all that research and write these scripts and practice reading it and record it and all of that that was involved. Um, and their scripts were just really cute. Hi, a fifth grade, you're watching this to learn about plant needs. The first most important thing is that garlic needs sunlight. And they whips up a pic picture of garlic. <laughs> sunlight seeps in through the leaves just as well as taking in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and sunlight are joined by water. Water comes from the roots, travels through them, and together they make food for the plant, which is a type of sugar called glucose. The process is called photosynthesis. As you know it, when you eat garlic or any plant, you're also consuming a tiny amount of sunlight. Animals like deer, rabbits, or even your cat can eat a plant. And that means they're eating water and sunlight. Isn't that mind blowing? See you next time. And they're all just, you know, having a lot of fun making this project. Um, so anyway, I, I want to finish with one last unit that I did in the past, which is on memoir, um, because, Integrating our school garden has really given students opportunities to read about content that they're interested in, but also provide our students with authentic experiences to write about. So when I did a unit on memoir, it's really important because it ties in so well with service learning projects that are related to the garden. So for example, the fifth graders each year plant seedlings in our greenhouse, and then we host a plant sale. And one year our students wrote memoirs after the the plant sale and that really showed the impact the experience had on the students. Eight, one student wrote, I felt really good as I saw customers come and go, walking in and out. I thought there were a million people coming and going. I knew that I was wrong about no one coming and that a lot of people went. It made me feel amazing. I was thinking in my mind that my class worked hard day after day for almost a month getting ready for this day. That day finally came and we finally got to see our plant sell our plants to wonderful people who were so nice to us and they made me feel good. I'd finally gotten to sell the plants that my class and I had planted and worked so hard to keep healthy and strong. I felt like I had done something great. I felt like I can do so much more and that I can help the environment. I felt amazing. Um, when we can integrate garden-based learning with literacy, kids are really proud to share their writing and their work with their peers and with their community. 
and they're simultaneously learning important lifelong skills. Um, they're researching, they're crafting, they're writing for many different purposes and many different audiences, and all of these have meaning to their lives. So thank you uh, for listening and thanks for having me. Thank you, Abby. That was awesome. Um, next, we will be moving to um, Stephanie Wade from RSU 20. Take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And I have to get the right screen to share, sorry. Um, it's great to see you all. Thank you. And thanks, Abby, for your presentation. Um, it's really exciting to hear about all of the writing that your students are doing. I have been teaching classes at colleges over the past seven years that focus on food justice and educational equity. And I've paired my college students at Unity College and at Bates College with K-12 students for hands-on learning and writing projects. And I'm gonna give you a brief overview of that, but I wanna focus mostly on what I'm calling the almanac of garden writing, which is a structure to create a seasonal ecological <clears throat> approach to writing. So that's my preview and here's just a snapshot of students in the garden. So as you likely know, almanacs are a longstanding form of multi-genre public writing. And in almanacs, we find information, we find poetry, we find images. And the original almanacs also included blank space for people to make them their own and mark them up. And what I am hoping to do, I am working on, is creating an almanac that has two parts. One would be a collection of writing prompts that line up with gardening activities that are seasonal. And I'm hoping some of you will join me in this project. And I have a Google Doc that I'll put in the chat so you can see the structure that I've created with some folks through other workshops. And then as this collection grows, what I'm hoping the Almanac will become is a template for schools and community groups to publish their garden-based writing. And so at the Drinkwater School, you might have the Edna Drinkwater Almanac of Garden Writing, and then your students could publish their work either in a hard copy or digitally, or we could collaborate and have a Waldo County Almanac of Garden Writing. Um, there are lots of different ways that I think we could use this project to collect our writing prompts together and then to highlight and publish the students' work for various public audiences. So that's the vision. Uh, this came out of some observations I've made and research I've done that in schools and traditional classes, writing and writers are constrained by rules-based approaches. And this rules-based approach in the classroom is very similar visually and in terms of negative consequences to industrial approaches to agriculture. And we see this in the classroom in a way that I call an industrial approach to education. And so when we get out of the classroom and we move into the garden, we have space for work that engages students in different ways, um, especially students who are marginalized, offers opportunities for inquiry-based writing that enacts principles of universal design for learning and is ecological in that it promotes life and cultivates soil health of our imagination just like we know it's important to cultivate soil health in the garden. So I'll give you a quick 
overview of how I've done this in my classes. In college creative writing classes, I introduce college students to writing pedagogy and they practice writing workshops with each other. And then we play and garden together with school children to get to know them. The college students developed writing prompts and they facilitated writing workshops for the younger students. And those of us in this Zoom who are writing teachers know how labor intensive it is to teach writing. And one of my goals is to create more opportunities to put college students in K-12 classrooms for these projects to distribute the labor of it. This is at the Troy School over by Unity. And this is in Lewiston, Maine, where we worked at the Geiger School. And I love um, how you can see the engagement on all of the kids' faces. And it's a very reciprocal process. The college students are learning about the community and the community needs and are starting to feel like they're part of the community. And the younger school children love having, um, you know, teenagers and young adults who listen to them. And then I would have the college students at the end engage in reflective writing and document what they learned. And I'm not gonna go through all of this now. I'll share the link in the chat and you can see links to the students' work. And getting back to what this means for our students as writers, a lot of students and even adult writers feel uncomfortable with the messiness of their early drafts and they don't wanna show their writing to anyone. And we had an opportunity for this impromptu lesson in the garden where we had all of these blemished ugly tomatoes and we collected them. And then we made salsa out of them. And that became a lesson for the students that they could then turn their messy writing into something that was more tasty. And so in the garden, there are all of these impromptu opportunities to teach writing. Um, near the end of this work, I developed several academic writing projects that scaffolded students through the study of food justice. And they worked in school and community gardens and saw sort of on the ground the need for more food equity and education equity. And the college students then developed research projects that resulted in public writing that served community needs. And throughout this, the hands-on work helped the students build community with each other, which made some of the hard parts of writing like peer review go more smoothly because they had already developed these connections. So you can see the students working together to move, remove collaborative species, um, invasive species in the garden. And here they are in the classroom working together as they're developing research questions. Um, and these visual mirrors really capture how working together in the garden helped them work together on these intellectual projects. Mm -hmm. um, these students also worked with high school students and I had a partner who was a food court member and she had them do a number of icebreakers. So they developed trust with each other and the high school students were more experienced gardeners. So they taught my students how to garden and my students were more experienced writers. So they helped the high school students with their writing. So all of these reciprocal relationships developed. And at the end of this semester, the college students created posters for a public poster walk at the Bates campus. And these posters were all about ways we could use the Bates Campus Garden to cultivate social justice. And so they were small projects such as incorporating more art to larger projects. A group of students designed a summer camp to run at the Bates, um, in the Bates Garden and they got a grant, but unfortunately because of COVID, we haven't been able to run that garden. And then um, just this past year, even with COVID going on, a group of my students studied how to make story walks and they created a story walk for the garden at the nutrition center in St. Mary's and they integrated QR codes into it so that as people walk by the garden they can scan the QR code and then that takes them to a website and I think if I click on this can you see the website a new 
And so I'm not going to go through all of this, but later at your leisure, you can. So the students in this case were engaging in um, art and digital writing together. So I'm going to stop my share and I will just grab one or two links to share with you. And I hope when we have Q&A, you'll ask me questions and I hope we can stay in touch and continue to develop writing prompts together. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, that was awesome. Um, and I'll just briefly say our final speaker was supposed to be Neil Lash, but he was unable to um, last minute unable to join us this morning, but he was going to talk about um, the book that he uses uh, with his um, high school classroom, The Seed Garden, The Art and Practice of Seed Saving. Um, and that will be included in the resource documents you'll receive. Uh, we are running a little bit behind on time, but um, I'm gonna open it up for Q&A so you can Feel free to like pop your questions into the chat or unmute yourself um, and we'll have some q and I will, let's see, I can spotlight all the speakers, I think, if I'm handy enough. Uh, and then maybe. Um, Whoops. So does anyone have any questions? Do you share your work with the school administrators to just develop support for your garden work? Well, I know Abby definitely does. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we go right to the source. <laughs> We've also done some presentations to the school board. Uh, we did that to try to power the school on solar, which is a project we're still working on right now. Um, but the administration is super, super supportive of the work. They love how it brings the community together. Um, they love that the local people who are even here just in the summertime come to our farm stand all the time and so they they pretty much will do anything to support the garden they just built us a brand new shed um so i feel really lucky to be so supported at drink water i would say i use um social media they have a school garden page that on uh, facebook that will often get shared within the informed citizens page for the district um I can't say my district is super supportive because I have absolutely no funding for the garden program. It's all grants and student fundraising and community giving. Um, but if this is going to continue into my retirement, they better start thinking about funding it. So I try to, I try to be as public as possible so many people will know about the projects that go on. We have both of the, because we our superintendent is in the building. It's a very small school. Um, and just as an aside, he's a former chef. And when I was making juice and actually cutting up peaches, he came in and did a knife skill session with the kids. So he's, he's particularly supportive as is our building administrator. It, it, it's, it, that makes it, that's easy. And the custodian is, is supportive too. Any other questions? I'm just gonna add on too, because of what Lynn said that we've been, we've also supported it with grants. It's not just from the administration and we've gotten a, a number of main, um, main Ag in the Classroom grants, which has helped us tremendously to be able to get tools and things. But the, the larger infrastructure, like the shed and the greenhouse has come through other funding sources in addition to some grants together. 
And we've been able to be pretty self-sustaining right now too, um, because we have made quite a bit with our annual plant sale, our seedling sale and our summer farm stand. Um, so we've been just like cycling that money through and it pretty much comes out to be able to support the seeds and the soil and then some tools. And then we get the grants for the bigger things that we want to have. Um, so, that's been great, but the school board also has uh, has put into the budget an actual position for the summer for me. So I'm not just doing that volunteer over the summer. They are paying me to come in weekly and take care of the garden and to manage this student run farm stand. Um, and they put in a stipend during the school year, like a really small greenhouse stipend since I'm the one that manages that too. So that's that's been something like that I wrote a proposal for and they approved and they wanted to support it so that but I know not all schools will agree to that. I, I have a question and that is um, does your does the food service um, pay you for any of the produce that you provide for them? Because we, no. found, we found in in RSU 14 that um, took a few years that they will pay us for any food that is used not only in meals but also in any kind of cooking projects done during the school day, taste testing done during the school day. It's not a lot, it's a dollar a pound, but that really is a good motivator for the kids to weigh and add up all the produce that we give to the cafeteria and then we get reimbursed at the end of the year which allows for buying seeds for the following year tools etc so it's something to look into um, because it saves the district money because they pay more than a dollar a pound but it gives this garden program some funds um, especially for seeds and smaller kinds of things so it's, it's, it may be worth looking into that's amazing there was a question about the best place to go to look for grants. And I wanted to briefly just take a moment since Abby mentioned it too, that um, Maine Ag in the Classroom has grants available for schools. And right now our grants um, are open for all of our categories have, um, are open for applications, sorry, uh, that are due December 13th. So definitely check that out. And we also have on the Maine School Garden Network um, website, Susan just put in that um, there are funding ideas as well. Both of the both the Maine School Garden Network newsletter and Maine Ag in the Classroom newsletter um, have grant opportunities in them um, frequently. So um, yeah, definitely check out those newsletters for grant ideas and um, yeah. Lowe's, yep, they have some. So there are a lot of different grant opportunities available. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully that is a good yeah. starting point you can go from. So I think one other thing, I think um, the, um, what is it called? Cooperative Extension also, also in each county has grant opportunities. I don't know currently um, but just I get things from Cumberland County Master Gardeners, a cooperative extension for grant opportunities. So that's another place to look for grants. Thanks, Pam. You're welcome. Um, okay. So and also, um, oops, sorry, Kelsey. Okay. Donors Choose, I know I mentioned it earlier. I've received over $10,000 from Donors Choose. So if every, anybody ever needs help setting that up, I'm more than happy to help you. Um, but there's some great opportunities there. Carolina Biological Company is one of the vendors. You can order seeds, grow lights, pots, soil, vermiculite. Um, so that's another great resource. Mm. All right, so now I'm just going to, I'm going to cut my little part real short. Um, I'm sharing um, what everyone will be receiving after 
probably sometime next week because it's not fully done yet, but you're all going to be receiving um, some documents, the presentations that you saw today, as well as this, um, which has resources for participants. So all of the speaker contacts are on here, um, links mm -hmm. to um, several of the books and other resources that presenters talked about. Um, and then I just wanted to mention some other um, ag literacy resources that are available. Um, so one is the Read Me Agriculture Program, which is a program of Maine Ag in the classroom. And it happens in March. It's for classrooms pre-K to four, completely free for teachers to sign up for. Um, they sign up, we coordinate volunteers to go into the classroom and read a book and do an activity and the classroom gets to keep that book. Uh, it's a really great opportunity. You know, they get a guest speaker and a free book. I mean, it's pretty awesome. Uh, so look for more information on that coming in January. I will also say that Maine Agon Classroom has our Agriculture for Me book series, which uh, six books highlighting Maine agriculture, um, which are available paperback, digitally, and we have video read alouds. Um, so those are linked in this document. Um, there's another, this just happened, uh, I think it was last week, um, as a webinar um, from Poughkeepsie Farm Project in New York, which was Multicultural Children's Literature in the Garden. Um, so I linked that here, and then they also have a book list that is linked in here as well. Um, National Ag in the Classroom has a book list on diversity in children's agricultural literature, and they have the searchable Ag Literacy Curriculum Matrix, which has hundreds of books that you can um, look through um, to use in your classroom. The American Farm Bureau Foundation for Agriculture has recommended publications. They vet these books so that they are um, agriculturally accurate. They have a book of the year award book list and a searchable aglet catalog similar to the matrix. So these are just some other places that you can go um, to get uh, resources to incorporate literacy into, to incorporate uh, the garden and uh, literacy. And so you all are going to get um, that resource as well. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling very inspired from what we've heard so far today. Absolutely. Um, Thank you, next, uh, we are going to also, if you have any questions, um, definitely um, keep putting them in the chat, but we're going to move into a break time. Um, so please use this time to stretch your legs, use the restroom and transition to your cooking space um, and get ready to join us for our cooking demo that Sam is going to be leading us in. Um, and I think maybe if we can cut it down to a five minute break so that we can get a little bit back on track with our agenda. Um, so 916, if everyone could be uh, back and ready to roll. Um, we'll see you then. So brief little break and yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, good. Thank you for checking that. Ah, How's going?
Hey, Kelsey. Yeah. Is there a way to save what's in the chat? Because yeah. people put links in there and a lot of times after a Zoom call, then it just disappears. I'm like, oh, I didn't click on the chat, so I can't get it anymore. How, how do we do that? Um, you There's three little dots on the chat and you can click save yep. chat. Oh, okay. So do that before we end the Zoom call. Yeah. At some point. Okay. All right. Thanks. Lovely. Are we ready for our cooking demo? Is we ready? You ready to make pancakes? We're excited. <laughs> it's going to make me hungry. <laughs> So um, I want to make sure everyone's ready, whoever is joining me. Oh my goodness, the whole family is involved. This is wonderful. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see. So we have Kelsey and her family. Anyone else by like either emoji thumbs up or just like a, a wave? I'm watching. <laughs> I'm not cooking that, but. Okay. I just want to make sure that those who are joining me feel ready. Lovely. Okay. Um, quick note on time. I'll try and go as quickly as I can, but I also want you to be able to have the experience of making these fun pancakes. So um, I'm going to step back and try not to cut too much of my head off. But also make sure you can see what is happening behind me. Okay. Hello everyone, um, welcome to my apartment. <laughs> and you'll see that I have a sort of setup here. So trying to make sure that you can see everything I'm doing. Um, first, I am Sam Grenier. I'm a SNAP-Ed nutrition educator. So more or less a traveling educator that pairs with the SNAP program um, that stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's federal dollars that goes to um, families that might need help with their grocery spending. So what I do with the education part of SNAP is I just do nutrition, nutrition, nutrition and recipes in pre-K all the way to adult spaces. So today um, we are preparing one of our SNAP Ed recipes called Perfect Pumpkin Pancakes. I'm assuming you all have this recipe, whoever's joining. Um, and I'm assuming that you've all washed your hands already. So <clears throat> let's see. Pumpkin pancakes are really fun. They are very timely right now. I am using canned pumpkin, but in your school gardens, if you happen to grow pumpkin and want to prepare pumpkin puree, it is possible and a lot of fun and very messy. Um, I've done that with Eastport Elementary School students and we had a lot of fun. Uh, it was useful having small groups to work with. We like baked the pumpkin in the oven and just kind of like use the students to like scoop out the pumpkin and make our own pumpkin puree. But it's easy enough to just use canned pumpkin. So we'll get started. In my notes, I mentioned a French term called mise en place, which means everything in its place. You'll see that I have everything out that I need in my recipe. I have my two types of flour. Notice we're using whole wheat flour and all-purpose flour. This is a great way to get some of your nutrition in. Whole wheat flour has lots of benefits, including fiber and some B vitamins. So if you, uh, you can do this with any of your baking, make half your recipe whole wheat flour. It's a really great addition. So we have two flours. We have brown sugar, baking powder, Instead of pumpkin pie spice today, I prepared the homemade version at the bottom of our recipe. Um, salt, an egg, canned pumpkin milk, and veggie oil. I think I just need the egg. Okay, cool. So if you all are ready, we're gonna go by our instructions. So instruction number one, Combine our whole wheat flour, white flour, brown sugar, baking powder, so all of the dry ingredients. So if you wanna go ahead and do that with me, we have our two bowls set up. One of our bowls is gonna be dry ingredients and then our wet ingredients. I'm gonna go ahead and measure our dry ingredients. 
When we measure, we want to make sure our flour or anything is straight across the measuring cup. That's how you know you have the exact amount you need. Also have my uh, skillet warming up over here. It's a fancy little like panini maker, but you can also use a pan on the stove. Baking powder. There's a whole tablespoon of baking powder in this recipe, so it's pretty fluffy. You'll notice the pancakes come out really fluffy. There's that brown sugar. And feel free to unmute yourselves if you have any questions along the way. Brown sugar is fun because it's one of the only things you want to pack into a measuring spoon. Okay. Salt. We need a teaspoon of salt. Lovely. I hope you all are following me so far. Um, I've done some Zoom classes, cooking classes before, and it's kind of fun um, to check in with folks as they're kind of making their own recipe. I'm using a whisk to mix all of my dry ingredients together. You're welcome to sift it. Um, it makes them fluffier, but it really doesn't matter. I like to use a whisk. Really get those combined. Okay. I need my spices. How you guys doing? We're doing good. Hazel's mixing. Oh, you're doing an amazing job. Excellent work, you guys. I'm gonna move forward to my wet ingredient bowl now. So I'm putting my dry ingredient bowl aside. And in step number two, it looks like I'm mixing all of my wet ingredients. So I have my egg. Those are fun to crack. I have my canned pumpkin. You can use your own pumpkin puree too, if you would like. Put that all in there. Milk and oil, I have one and three quarters cup milk. I'm using unsweetened vanilla almond milk today just because that's what I drink. But um, you know, you can use cow's milk, you can use goat milk if you want. You can use any type of milk that's out there. Okay, and then I just need my oil. Two tablespoons of vegetable oil. Um, I think this is a really fun recipe to make ahead of time, even make a double or triple batch and go ahead and just freeze the uh, pancakes in the freezer. That way you can just throw them in the toaster for an easy breakfast. So you can take maybe a Sunday afternoon, prepare yourself some pancakes, and it's all ready for the week. I'm going to use my whisk again and just whisk up those wet ingredients. A cooking show. <laughs> Julia Child. <laughs> Julia Child. If you make a mistake, you just toss it. <laughs> I don't know if I'm not skilled. Okay, I'm going to move these things so that you guys can really see this. That is step number two. So moving forward to step number three. Add the wet ingredients to the dry ingredients. Stir until just moist. That are maybe lumpy. So um, for me, this is one of the most important steps of making pancakes. Pancakes are pretty simple to make homemade. Um, but I don't like to overmix my pancake batter. If I overmix my pancake batter, they might end up turning a little bit more flat and uh, rubbery almost. So. Gonna go ahead and mix that batter just until the most of the dry ingredients are mixed into that those wet ingredients. You'll see I'm using a rubber spatula for this. You can use a whisk, um, whatever tools you have at hand. 
I'm really getting that mixed in. It smells delicious. I've got my griddle heating up. So if you don't have your pan heating up yet, I suggest you get that nice and warm. When you're cooking, I, I like to use a hot pan. Um, if you preheat a pan, it just gets that food cooking right away um, instead of you know waiting for your food to warm up along with the pan. It just takes that much longer. Cool. So that's just about mixed. I'll show you my batter. You see it's pretty thick. It's got some lumps in there. That's okay. It's going to keep it nice and fluffy. I'm sure we have some exp expert pancake makers in the crowd. Maybe have some different tips for me. Cool. So, looks like you're mixing, perfect. I have my griddle here. It is a nonstick griddle, so I'm going to go ahead and not add oil, but if you're using a pan, you can add oil to it, make sure it doesn't stick. And I'm gonna use a quarter cup measure. You can make any size pancakes you want. You can even use a metal cookie cutter and make your own fun shapes. Or little Mickey Mouse heads, those are fun. So I have my preheated skillet. I'm just gonna plop them right down. Mm -mm -mm. My husband will be excited to have pancakes when he gets home. And I love that there's pumpkin added to this. It just adds a little bit more of um, nutrition to it and some flavor. Cool. And as many of you may know, we want to wait for some bubbles to form at the top and some browning along the edges before we flip our pancakes. So let's wait for that. I'm curious if any of you have tips and tricks related to pancake making that you want to share. Um, I like to put blueberries on, like I, probably not with pumpkin, but maybe. But you know, when they're um, on the first side, just putting some blueberries on the top, and um, that always adds something. Especially if you freeze blueberries, or in the summer when you know they're so readily available, those are really That's good. True. Yes, I think that blueberries would be pretty good in this recipe. It's not like a prominent, yeah, in flavor. I don't know. One of, my, one of my friends likes to add cinnamon to her blueberries. And so I kind of th think that's a similar thing here. Um, yeah, pumpkin pancakes for fun. I was going to say that I'm gluten free, but we've used the King Arthur gluten free all purpose blend, and it's really good with pancakes um, and other baking projects too. Yes, good note on the gluten-free. I've also used um, King Arthur gluten-free all-purpose mix. And I just love, uh, they're scientists in yeah. the gluten-free, like, or just non-gluten-free and gluten-free baking world. Um, King Arthur just, mm. they're always researching recipes and ways to make um, flour blends and, and recipes better. So mm. yeah, I, I, I like them a lot. Uh, I did use King Arthur flour today, just the regular flour, but nice. <laughs> also instead of milk, I like using buttermilk. Um, if, if you're, unless you're lactose intolerant, but I think buttermilk just really gives it just a little bit of a tang that's really nice in a pancake. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And you can make your own. No, uh, yes. You can make your own milk buttermilk. And, and then, um, you can use vinegar. You just add um, a teaspoon of vinegar to a cup of low fat or whole milk and it will sour, but I still think buttermilk tastes a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's ways around it, either vinegar or lemon juice, but yeah. yeah. The real thing is a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we all have our like various preferences when it comes to, especially breakfast foods, I don't know. Um, 
Let's see, it's looking pretty good. I think I'll, I'll give it one flip just to, just to finish off um, and I'll let them cook the rest of the way. So, and I'll give it back to uh, Kelsey after that, but I'm curious whomever Sam, joined. I'm, yes. I'm admiring your tree cookie table. <laughs> yeah, isn't it beautiful? It's absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Oh my goodness. My uncle made this table for our wedding. Wow. And he's just an amazing um, woodworker. He doesn't even do this for a living. And I'm just, I'm, he, he does construction, but I think that he should get into like craftsmanship more because he enjoyed the process and he just made this beautiful piece of like art. Um, so grateful to have it in our kitchen. <laughs> it, well, I, it caught my eye right away. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, he put a lot of like love into this table. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just, I'm so happy. It did come from an amazing tree. I think, I don't remember. He has a whole story about how he got the, the wood cookies, but he's always keeping an eye out on the side of the road to see if there's any like dead trees that are like needing some uh, creative love. But anyway, I'm gonna flip a pancake. I don't know which one I dropped first. It's nice and bubbles. Looking pretty good. I'm gonna let the rest go for a little while longer. But they are pretty fluffy. Mm. For those of you who joined me, how is the process for you? <laughs> I mean, they smell really good. And they're looking pretty good. Over oh, here. wow. Yay. Oh, it looks gorgeous. Excellent work, you guys. People, are you excited to eat these pancakes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they're beautiful. You guys did such a good job. Thank you. All right. And thank you, Sam, for that awesome cooking demonstration. Um, we are currently already over our time limit. So we're gonna like wrap it up real quick and do our door prizes. So thank you to everyone who stayed with us. Sorry, I'm moving so that um, Jackson can finish up that pancake process. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, Anna so kindly has um, entered names into a random name generator to raffle off some door prizes. And we have six of them. Um, I'm also putting a link in the chat in a sec. Uh, Anna, go ahead and start that process. Or if you already have, um, I'm gonna put a link in the chat once I find it, um, <laughs> to the evaluation form, which is also gonna be emailed out to everyone. Um, and so if you can fill that evaluation out, um, that would be awesome. Like I said, if you are looking for contact hours or partial CEU, um, enter your email in that and we'll, we will send that to you. Um, and, it'll, and it'll help us plan future events. Uh, we're looking for your ideas on what you want to hear about. So we have six store prizes. Um, we have, oh, our first winner is our panelist, Ted. Woohoo. Ted, we'll make sure we don't send you your book because your book is one of our, <laughs> um, one of our door prizes. Um, and, uh, so Ted, send me your mailing address. Um, and we'll get, we'll get out your door prize. Who do we have next? Rebecca Sousa from DOE. Awesome. All right. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Send me your mailing address and I will, um, and the door prizes will get sent out. All right. Who is our third one? And pour your flight. Woohoo! What do we got next? 
Sarah Lavelli, Lavelli, sorry. Not sure how to pronounce. Kate, with no last name, is next. <laughs> Let's see, and one more, Kelsey? Yes. All right, hang on, everybody. Drum roll. Let's see, Anna Lowe was the next one, but we might have lost her. So maybe we need a new, a yes. new next one. Okay, hang on one second. Kate Garland. Okay, thank you, Kate. There we go, Lynn Holland, number six. Holland, woo! All right, so yes, please uh, email me your mailing address and we will get those door prizes out to you. Thank you to everyone who, uh, sorry if you can hear Hazel crying about something in the background, um, but thank you to everyone who uh, joined us for our um, awesome, um, presentations this morning, our teacher panel and uh, cooking demonstration. I was super inspired and I hope that you all were as well. Um, so now we're going to be moving on to the business portion of our annual meeting. I invite you to stay with us and hear about what Maine School Garden Network has been up to for the last year, but totally understand if you cannot. Um, so I'm going to hand the floor over to um, Pam and Kat. Um, hold on a second. Whoops. I, I do have slides here. <clears throat> um, who will take it away with the business portion of our meeting. Whoops. So, Kat and Pam, y'all are up. Kat, you're on. <laughs> okay, well, um, get my right page up here. Yeah, well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming today. This has been a really great presentation. It's really it's so inspiring to see what everybody's doing, the wonderful things that are happening. I mean, when we got started back in 2000. 2009 this was some of our dreams was to really get schools really using those gardens in every every way that they possibly can and impressing their administration and getting funding for it and getting paid to do it so this